appreciate that. All right, we can, we can start now, Larry. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be in Esther chapter 4 tonight, and we've been in Esther for three weeks, covered three chapters, and uh, the title of our series is God is Now Here, and we've tried to mention every week the fact that uh, God's name does not appear in the pages of Esther, all these chapters, but you can see him at work. You can see his providence, you can see his blessing, you can see him working behind the scenes, and we'll continue to see that tonight. Uh, we will, Again, as, as we go through this book, and again, I haven't had scripture up there on Wednesdays just because of how we're kind of covering it, so hopefully you have your Bible with you uh, to look upon. But uh, we're going to cover the topic tonight of perilous times. We saw last week in chapter 3, Haman kind of has now risen to the scene. Haman has decided, I don't like Mordecai. Um, so what I'm going to do is get rid of Mordecai. And so he has now gotten the king's approval to issue a decree that all the Jews that are captive in the land shall be killed. And so that's what we're facing as we go into chapter 4. Esther, of course, is the new queen. Esther is a Jew. So she's on the hit list, okay? She's, she's going to be killed with the people as well. So every Jew right now in chapter 4 is facing perilous times. If God doesn't intervene... They're going to be wiped out by the wicked plot of this, this evil guy named Haman. Um, it's been estimated that there were about 15 million Jews in the kingdom of Persia. That's a lot of people, folks. <laughs> Can you imagine just the, the, the king and Haman just deciding we're going to take the lives of 15 million people? Really for no reason at all, uh, but, but other than Haman's wicked plan. Uh, of course, that, that kingdom of Persia stretched from India to Ethiopia, so they were in a lot of different areas and a lot of different provinces spread throughout there. Some of the Jews had already returned back to Jerusalem uh, under the leadership of, of Jeremiah and Ezra, Nehemiah, those type of people. Uh, they'd already removed, uh, some of them had already removed a remnant of them, had gone back to Jerusalem to start rebuilding and that type of thing. But most of the people were still there uh, scattered in the provinces of, of Persia. Um, as they're rebuilding the temple and the walls, they're trying to get worship reinstated for, for the Jews there. Uh, we saw that the Jews in Shushan, those in the palace and those around Persia, uh, they're there, but they're not really practicing their Jewish customs. They're not really practicing uh, their Jewish religion. Uh, the, the proof, some of the proof of that is found in the fact that they fasted and mourned, but there's no mention of prayer to God in their time of crisis. And we'll kind of see that a little bit tonight. So uh, some of their rituals that they would normally do, they were not doing because even like, like, like we said, uh, Mordecai and Esther were kind of in hiding. Their Jewish nationality had not been revealed until last chapter, chapter 3. And so some of the things they would have normally done in public as Jews, they were not doing. And so hopefully, again, as they're going back out of captivity, they're going to start redoing those things. But, but now we'll see at the end of this chapter, as God works everything out, they're going to be able to do what they want right where they're at even. But, uh, so the Jews are in captivity. Question for you. I know we didn't expect to have to answer questions tonight on Wednesday, but a uh, question for you. Why are the Jews in captivity? Because of their sin, okay? They're, they're simply paying the price for decisions they made. They're paying the price for their sin and rebellion. Um, they, they had disobeyed God. They had turned to idols again uh, and not serving the true and living God. So God had, had sent them into captivity. They're continuing now in Esther to reap the bitter fruits of sin. Sin always has consequences. It affects us. It affects those around us. We don't get to choose the consequences. We choose the sin, okay? We don't get to choose the repercussions. And so, so the Jewish nation now is even dealing with this in Esther. Um, God has been very merciful to Israel. Uh, God is a merciful God. God has promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, you know, I'll bless them that bless them and, uh, the, and curse them that curse thee and those types of things. Uh, but all these, all these prophecies and all the blessings that God has promised to the Jews uh, God is still on the throne waiting to bring those things to pass. He's just got to get the people in line. <laughs> you ever stop and think about that? You ever wonder in your life, what did I miss out on from God today because I was too busy being a knucklehead? Huh? What blessing did I miss out on this week because I chose to, I knew I, you know, I probably should have done this, but I chose to, and I went my own way in this area. What, what did I miss out on? Because here's the thing, God doesn't just say, I ain't blessing you, <laughs> Okay. But he has blessings waiting for us. But I think sometimes I miss them because of me. I get in the way. That's kind of the Jews here. They're in their own way. Uh, so as we go into Esther chapter 4, we'll start reading through the scripture here as we go through our outline. Uh, let's think about this thought about how all the Jews, 15 million plus people, experiencing this perilous times. 
uh, death is at, the, is at the end. It's been chosen for them. They've got a date set up. On this date, you're going to be annihilated. Can you imagine living your life that way? Getting up the next day thinking, okay, only, only 212 days left. Think about it. This is a, this is a scary time for the nation of Israel. Uh, so let's look at this thought as we go through uh, Esther chapter 4. And the first thing we want to see tonight is the display of grief. The display of grief. And we'll look at the first, uh, about the first nine verses as we cover this point. We'll spend a little bit of time here at the very beginning or just on the first three verses. Um, look at verse, uh, first three verses. We'll read those and then we'll get into the outline. Uh, the display of grief. Chapter 4. Uh, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate. For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, the first thing we see in the first uh, couple of verses here is the sorrow of Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai is dealing with this. It hurts. His people his nation, his land, his cousin, <laughs> uh, the queen, uh, is, is going to be affected by this awful decree. Uh, a couple of things you see in Mordecai, of course, the, the, the rending or the renting of clothes is a sign of grief. Uh, you see that all throughout Scripture, all through the Old Testament, and Second Samuel, all over the place. David, David rent his clothes, and many other people in Scripture did that as a sign of grief. The sackcloth and ash, signs of grief. This was not just somebody said, I'm going to put on some you know, clothes so I look like a dirty person. This was, this was a sign of, of mourning. This was a sign of grief for them. Job uh, put on sackcloth and ash, if you remember, if you read the book of Job and that type of thing. I think the big difference is between Job and Mordecai is this. Job put on sackcloth and ash and repented. Mordecai puts on sackcloth and ash, and he's just mourning. Okay? So there's a little bit of difference there. He's, he's got grief, and he's got mourning, and he's got feelings for the people. But you don't see repentance at this particular time. From any of the Jews, okay? And again, they're where they are because of sin. They're where they are, and repentance is necessary. They need to get right with God. But they're, they're mourning, <laughs> but not quite reached the stage of repentance yet. Um, I put down this thought, letter number three there. I want us to see the importance of the promotion of Mordecai. If you remember back in chapter two, uh, he had, a, he had a, uh, a little position. And then he uncovered that plot. Remember the, the two guys that were going to kill the king? He discovered the plot, reported it to the king. His name went down in the history books as the guy that foiled the plot, right? And he got a promotion. And now you see him sitting in the king's gate. Uh, this is very important because sitting in the king's gate also gave him access to the decrees that are written by the king. And so we're going to see here later that, that because of the promotion, he's able to actually go back to those books and remind the king later, hey, I'm the guy, remember? I'm the guy who saved your life, remember that? So it all comes into, in full circle later on. So it's very important you see the promotion there that took place. We might not think much of it when it took place when we read it, but we're going to see throughout the book it's extremely important. Um, I put down this thought here as well as you think about Mordecai here displaying his grief. It's very important for us who know the truth to make sure we make the truth known no matter what the cost. Mordecai in verse number two is taking a very public open stance i am a jew i am set to be killed in this i will mourn for my people he could have stayed quiet he could have not told anybody but he publicly said i i i am the lord's child <laughs> I, I jehovah is my god okay that's the god that i worship so he's openly taking a stand you know and, and i think just kind of remind us as a church that there's a lot of things that we know at, to be truth and in the world in which we live to stand for that truth is very difficult sometimes, but we have to. We have to take a stand for right. Uh, we, we can't be wishy-washy in a lot of areas. We can't be up one day and down the next, and I believe this, and tomorrow I change my mind. There's, there's some truth, and here's the thing. It really doesn't matter what the world says. If the Bible says it's truth, it's truth, and we have to stand for that. Now, again, let's be careful. We, we can stand in a loving way, okay? I, I, I'll say it this way. You don't have to be a jerk and stand for truth. Does that make sense? You, you can still be kind to people and stand for truth. And I think there has to be a good balance there. Uh, I think there has to be, a, again, if I'm going to be an idiot and, and treat people poorly because I'm standing for truth, that's not going to do anything to help them come into a relationship with Christ. Uh, so there has to be a good balance there. But when I know the truth, um, I have to be willing to say, stand for the truth and share the truth. Uh, I put down a, a couple more thoughts here uh, under Mordecai here, if I can get this thing to 
There we go. Uh, number, number five there. No grieving person was allowed near the king. We read that in verse number uh, two, I believe it was. Uh, anybody who was in sackcloth or ash, rent clothes, things like that, was not allowed into the presence of the king. That's why Mordecai is still in the gate. Um, I thought about that and I thought, the king's living in a bubble. He's living in an artificial paradise. As long as he's not aware that there's trouble out there, there must not be any trouble. <laughs> it's, it's the, it's the uh, um, ostrich with the head in the sand. That's how, he, that's how the king is being treated. We don't want any trouble to be known by the king. <laughs> and so he's not even aware of what's going on. But that's why Mordecai is not actually in the king's presence. That's why he's in the king's gate. Uh, the last thing there, the Jews are mourning throughout Persia. Uh, this was not just a localized that took place at the, at the palace at Shushan. Every province, every town had gotten this decree uh, in, in everybody's language. It was, it was there. It was posted. Uh, the date was there. Um, they knew this. And so now they're mourning. What I want us to see again, and, and I'll point this out probably a couple times tonight, there's still no repentance. They're just mourning for the decree that's been passed that's, that's going to cause their death. Uh, there's no repentance. No repentance. Mourning. Uh, there's no praying to God for, you know, for forgiveness. They're just mourning. They're just mourning. You know, I, and I thought about that, and I couldn't help. And again, you know how I am. I, I, I couldn't help think about um, our country today. And we as Christians beg God, God send revival. Our country needs revival. Our country needs revival. Our country needs revival. Um, I think the problem is this. Repentance is still an issue. And until God's people <laughs> get thoroughly right with God... We really don't have much of a, of a right to ask God to heal our land. And so as we struggle with repentance, just like the Jews did, it's a common thing. We, we deal with it. Uh, so repentance is necessary. They're mourning, but they need to get to that place in their life where they're, they're getting right with God and seeking repentance. Uh, so that's the, that's the, uh, the mourning of, of Mordecai there. Look at the second part of, this out, uh, of, the, of that first point there. And, and look at the informing of Esther. Oh, there we go. The informing of Esther. Um, Mordecai and Esther have to get a plan together. They have to figure out how are we, how are we going to handle this. You're the queen, but you're a Jew. How are we going to handle this? So, so look, at, uh, look at verse 4. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. We'll get, read a couple more verses here in a minute. The first thing is this. Esther is told of the grief of Mordecai. He's in sackcloth and he's in ashes and he's publicly uh, decry, uh, crying in, out in the gate, you know, oh, woe is me, oh, God, say, you know, uh, our people are under destruction. We're doing, and he's publicly mourning. And it moves her. It grieves her. She's not exactly sure of the cause, but she's grieved. Why is she grieved? This is the man that's raised her. This is the man who's acted like a father to her for so many years. This is the man who advised her uh, when, when she was sought out to go, go before the king. So this is, this is a serious thing. So if he is grieving, I'm grieving. And by the way, is that, is that not how Christianity is supposed to work? When, when one grieves, we all grieve. We're a body, you know, and we all have different functions and different purposes. But when one part of the body hurts, the rest hurt. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm walking proof right now, okay? I've experienced some of these things that the old people have told me about for years. <laughs> When, when your knee hurts, your, your back hurts, <laughs> and your shoulders start to hurt. It's just, it's just like one part hurts, it lets your whole body know, hey, I'm in pain, right? We know that. That's the way it's supposed to work. When one brother or sister in Christ hurts, we all hurt. By the way, that works with rejoicing as well. Don't, don't miss that. Okay, don't miss that because sometimes we're, we'll grieve when you grieve, but then God blessed you. Well, I didn't get up. A, 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 <laughs> okay? So, so if we're going to grieve with one another, we need to rejoice with one another as well, okay? And so, so Esther now is grieving. She, again, she's not sure why at this point. She will be. She's not sure why. But she's grieving because, because this man who raised her is grieving, and it bothered her. Um, she loved her cousin so much, she wanted him to have new garments. So she sent him new clothes because he, he's wearing sackcloth and ash. Let's get him new clothes. And, and he said, I, I'm not taking them. I'm not taking them. Now, I'll just say this. Mordecai had money. He could have bought his own new clothes. He was, he was mourning, okay? There's a reason he had sackcloth and ash on. And uh, so she sends him new clothes. He doesn't want it. Look at verse, uh, verse 5 and 6. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, 
whom he had appointed to attend upon her. This is the guy back in chapter 2 who took care of her as she was preparing to go before the, before the king and, and uh, uh, have herself as a possible queen candidate, okay? This was that main guy, basically, and he took favor to Esther, if you remember. Um, he said, whom he had appointed to attend to her and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai under the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. Uh, so number three, we have Hatak who again had attended the queen before, Esther sends him to investigate. What's the problem with Mordecai? He's, he's mourning, which makes me sad. I send him clothes, he won't take it. What is going on? Go find out. So this man, again, he, she had found favor with him because of the Lord. We saw that. Uh, they had a good relationship. She says, would you go check it out? He goes and checks it out in verse 5 and 6. Uh, we don't know a lot about Hatak. Uh, as you study some of the history and that type of thing, you can find out many people think he was possibly a Jew himself. Uh, there's no there's no 100% on that, but many people think that he was a Jew. Uh, so maybe that's why that favoritism was found uh, when he first met Esther. Uh, look at verse 7. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Letter D, or number 4 there, Mordecai unfolds the whole plot. To the king's chamber, Hatak. He says, uh, listen, here's what happened. Haman came before the king. He had a wicked plot. He offered a bunch of money to kill all the Jews. And by the way, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. That's why this bothers me so much. Um, you know, up to this point, Haman has been pretty quiet about his nationality. Okay? Can I just, and again, I, I try to at least poke us and prod us every now and then for current day things, Okay? Can I just say this? We should never be ashamed of our identity in Christ. That's who we are, folks. I know so many people today are looking to find themselves in the world. Who am I? What am I? I'm a child of the king. <laughs> okay? That's where we get our identity is in Christ. Nothing else matters. <laughs> and, and, and so don't ever, don't ever hold back on that. Don't ever be ashamed to share that with somebody. Don't ever be ashamed to testify of a relationship with Christ. Uh, it's a shame when Christians keep their relationship with God a secret. It's a shame. It truly is. You know, God, God says, I'll give you power to be witnesses unto me. We, we don't take the power and be a witness. Amen. Uh, never be ashamed of Christ or the gospel of Christ. Look at verse 8 and 9. And we'll finish out this point. Uh, also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Number five there, uh, Haman, or uh, not Haman, Mordecai, he sends a copy of the decree with a request to Esther. That request was very simple. You're going to have to reveal yourself as a Jew, and you're going to have to go before the king. The only hope we have here, Esther, is if you take a stand. If you unite with your people who are in mourning, and you go before the king and ask for something to be done, for your people. So now Esther's going to get put on the hot seat. How does Esther respond? That's what we're going to look at next. All right. So the next thing you see is this. You see the mourning of, 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 uh, of the Jews there and Mordecai. The second thing you see is the developing of a plan. Uh, Mordecai and Esther now have to get on the same page. And in the next few verses, uh, verse 10 through 14, we'll kind of see uh, what takes place here in uh, this plan that's being devised. Look at verse number 10. Again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king should hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. Uh, and they told the word, or, I'm sorry, and they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded Esther, uh, it said, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther, of course, we see that the, the rebuttal she kind of sends back to Mordecai, and Mordecai answers with great poison wisdom. You know, I'm often jealous and envious of people who respond to negative situations with poise and wisdom. 
because I'm just like, dude, grow up. You know? I'm like, here's how it is. Deal with it. You know, and Mordecai's all flowery and wordy and, hey, did you think of this? You know? I'm just like, come on. <laughs> you know, grow up. But uh, so I, I have great respect for people that do this. I try. I don't often succeed, uh, but I, I do try. But uh, look, at, look at a couple things here as we're developing the plan. First of all, the queen was challenged to act. Uh, the queen was challenged to act. Mordecai sends word and says, it's up to you now, Esther. I, I can't do anything. The, the people are set to die. You're the only one in a place of power that can do something. I'm challenging you, Esther. Again, I haven't steered you wrong yet. You need to go before the king. Now, I want to give you a couple of thoughts here about the queen. First of all, she lived in luxury, but she was kept in seclusion. Um, she was kept in seclusion. There's no way she could have personally gone and met with Mordecai. That's why Haytack is kind of being this go-between. She's kind of, it's kind of like, um, who was it that was uh, kept up in the, in the tower? Rapunzel. Rapunzel, yeah. You know, you can't get out of the tower. This is your home. You got to say, this is her. She's the queen. She's the queen of the land. She's the king's number one wife. That's a, that says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> and, and she's not even necessarily in the same room, in the same area where the king dwells. She's kept separate and secluded. So, so she could not speak with Mordecai directly, so she's using Haytack as the go-between go there. Verse number 11, she reminds uh, uh, Mordecai of a very important law. Anyone who goes before the king without being called and asked for, they're executed. He doesn't have to talk to him. He doesn't have to receive him. He doesn't have to look at him. He just has to snap his fingers. They're, 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 they're done. Now there's a, there's a time if he holds out the golden scepter, that means come on, I'll, I'll receive you and I'll talk to you without being called. But I, I, I could die. You understand that, Mordecai? Are you sure we're thinking the same plan here? I might die here. Um, only the king could spare me. You know, I, I thought about that and I thought, how many, how many men in Scripture put their lives in hazard and peril for the cause of Christ. Because the cause of Christ is greater than any one person. The cause of Christ is bigger than me. And so many times I have to be willing to say, listen, I'll step out into a hazardous, if you will, situation to make sure the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed and to make sure he is lifted up. Paul and Barnabas, the Bible talks about it in Acts chapter 15, were men who hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you see other men in Scripture, you think, think about all that Paul endured and, and went through with the beating and the persecution and the imprisonment. Why? All for the cause of Christ? Uh, it, it, that's kind of Esther saying, well, I know I need to, but I might get killed. Hey, Christian, listen, there may come a day in our country where being a Christian might get you killed. But I'll tell you what it's going to do real quick. It's going to separate the real Christians from the fake Christians. Amen? <laughs> and and we've got to be willing to take a stand and even die for the cause of Christ if necessary. Verse 12 and 13, as we, as we read there, he warns Esther, you're going to perish anyway. It, you know, if, if all the Jews are killed, um, <laughs> you're going to die anyways. So why not, why not risk your life to save the people instead of just dying with the people and saying nothing? That's what he says kind of in verse number 12 and 13. And then he closes this point out in verse number 14. Uh, he reveals his confidence that one way or the other, Jews are going to be delivered. He tells her, he says, if you don't do this, somebody else will. But your family will be destroyed. And then he reminds her in the end of verse 14, probably the most famous verse in all of Esther. Maybe you're here for such a time as this. Yeah, guys, I, and again, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll, I'll be real with you right now, okay, tonight. We don't always understand what we go through in life. I, I don't always agree with what God puts me through in life. I don't always like it. I wish it were different many times, all right? But I do know that God is in control, and God knows what he's doing. And maybe he puts me in a position for exactly that time. And I've learned to, to let go of my grip, if you will, on, on me. <laughs> and to say, God, if you've put me here, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. What, what is that reason? If, you're, if you'll reveal the reason, I'll, I'll do what you've asked me to do. Uh, and so he, he kind of he he silently scolds Esther. He's not being mean. He's just reminding her, look, somebody else will do it if you don't, because that's God. But, but here's the deal. Maybe you're here exactly for this purpose. You know, all the things that just happened to happen, all, this, all the chance circumstances that have happened so far in her life, right? We know that's not true. It's all God. But all this has led for, for, for this particular moment. Seize the moment. Seize the moment. 
So, so she's challenged, first of all. Secondly, you see this letter B. Letter B, the queen accepts the challenge. You know, had Esther held to her, I can't go in because the king might kill me, we'd have a whole different story. Okay? She accepts the challenge. Look at the last few verses of, of the, of the uh, passage here, the chapter, and then we'll finish the, uh, the outline up. Then Esther made the, uh, uh, bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. So she accepts the challenge. The first thing she asked him to do is she requested the Jews fast for this venture. She says, give me three days and just fast. Uh, don't eat anything. Don't, you know, just, just three days, just nope, nothing. Just fast. Let's bring this before, uh, before the Lord. Now, again, there's still no mention of repentance, <laughs> but, but they are fasting, fasting for a cause here. Um, and, and again, all that God has promised, just a little bit of getting your hearts right, is just waiting in store for them. <laughs> but they're still holding on. So she requests a fast there. Um, and then, of course, she, she says that they'll fast as well, her and her handmaids. And then she consents to try, even if it means she will perish. If I perish, I perish. This, again, is just a classic example of, of many Christians over the years who said, I don't care what it costs, I will live for Christ. You realize that the... the the pages that you hold in your lap right now, you realize how many thousands of men died just so we could have this today? <laughs> I, I, I read something the other day, and it was funny, but it wasn't funny. And uh, a pastor said, uh, you know, you, you Christians say that they'll, they'll, they'll die for Christ, but they won't even come to church on Sunday. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and I thought, wow, <laughs> maybe he's having problems. I didn't know, but I was like, that, you know, how true is that? Though? Yeah, I'll die for Christ, but when it comes down to it, will I? Uh, she says, if I, if I perish, I perish. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to accept this challenge. I'm going to do what God's asking me to do. I'm going to stand for my people. And but the same thing's true with us today. Whatever God's asking you to do, I don't think God's going to put us in that, that particular situation, but it may come to that in our country. We don't know. Uh, will, I, will I stand for Christ? And then verse number 17, the last verse of that, of that chapter there, Mordecai then gets with everybody and he proclaims the fast. We're going we're gonna to fast for Esther. She's going in. This is serious. It could cost her her life. Let's get God involved. Uh, let's, let's proclaim a fast amongst the people. And the last thing you'll see here tonight in our outline, uh, is in those last few verses there, uh, you see the providence of God working. Again, name is not mentioned. Name is not mentioned. But you see him doing exactly what he needs to do to accomplish his perfect will. Understand this, even though God lets wicked people and wicked rulers and wicked governments do their thing, it is still God and only God in his divine providence that controls everything in his will. He sets up kings, he removes kings, you can look at history, you can look at the Bible, uh, God does everything. God holds in his hands the heart of the king. Uh, the decisions that they make are, are, are God's will, he, he knows exactly what's going to happen, why and when and how. And we've got to trust him. God's in control. We know that. Uh, kings and rulers uh, think they're in charge of their own destiny. The Bible teaches us quite differently, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> uh, Daniel says this, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel's got it pretty good there. Uh, God is in control, and God is behind the scenes working even when we don't see it. And then that brings us to the thought, uh, to remember this. We see God working on behalf of his people everywhere in the Bible and even in the world today. And that's why we often quote and claim Romans 8, 28, right? We know that all things work together for good. To them that are called, uh, then love God, then we are called according to his purpose. Uh, God is working. God is working. God is working. We may not see it, we may not understand it, we may not agree with it, but God is working. Um, on the back side of your outline there, I just put down a couple simple thoughts, and this isn't necessarily part of the outline, but just kind of some reminders as we've gone through four chapters now. Uh, I want to show you, again, because God's name is not in the pages so far, but I want to show you His providence. Queen Vashti being removed from her position was the providence of God. Yes. Esther could not have become queen 
had she not been removed. Esther being chosen as queen was the providence of God. How many hundreds of ladies did she compete against? Okay. And her being chosen was the providence of God. Uh, Mordecai holding a government position was the providence of God. Again, this is a Jew in foreign land, but he had a small role and, of course, then got promoted as well. Uh, that's the next, next thing, his promotion and receiving information of, of the plan to kill the king. That was all God's providence. He was not in the right place at the right time. It happened to overhear this. God put him there. Uh, and God, God planned this in the providence of God. And then from the chapter tonight, Esther, Esther, <laughs> that girl, Esther, risking her life to save the Jews from extinction, providence of God. Because as we look at our world today, unfortunately, in Christianity, there'd be a whole lot of people would say, well, I ain't going to go that far. I'll live for God, but maybe it comes to putting my life on the line. I'm not so sure. Right? Esther said, you know what? If I perish, I perish. Providence of God. Next week, we're going to pick up in chapter number five, just 14 short verses. Um, and we'll look, at the, we'll look at the topic, if I get this to switch there, uh, God at work for his people. Esther is now putting herself in position to allow God to just open up the portals of glory and bless, okay? And so we're going to see how God now starts working in chapter 5 for his children. And by the way, he still does it today, doesn't he? He still works and supplies and provides for his children. We're thankful for that, aren't we? And we'll see it in Esther's life uh, next week as we pick up in chapter 5. So read those 14 verses and get familiar with them as we look at them next week. Uh, we'll uh, just keep on moving through the book of Esther till we, till we finish it up, all right? And so that's where we'll be next week. We get all of our blanks filled in. Questions, comments, thoughts? Our, yes, ma'am. Right. Mm -hmm. what, uh, in the scripture that we read, it was really just the ones there in, the, in that area of the palace, the Shushan area. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a decree that was spread everywhere because that would have taken time. And so for the three day for the three day fast they did, yeah, it was just those that were right there, which which still would have been quite a quite a hefty bit bit of people. So yep. Yeah, it was just those localized ones. Yep. Yep. All right. Well let's pray and then and we will be dismissed this evening. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and goodness. Thank you for your blessings. Lord, thank you for the time of prayer that we've had tonight and Lord, we know we have many requests, and uh, we thank you that you hear and answer prayer, but we're also thankful for the praises tonight, and Lord, over, over every week it seems like we're able to come back the next week with praises, and we're so grateful for that, and uh, thank you for being good to us, and uh, thank you for the book of Esther, Lord, the stand that Esther is now taking. May we uh, continue to learn from that and grow in that area of our life. Challenge us, Lord, to be the Christian we should be in the midst of a, of a sinful world. Lord, may we stand for Christ, I pray. Uh, we ask you to bless now the remainder of our week. Uh, help us to live for you, point people to Christ this week. And, Lord, start preparing us even now for the uh, services on Sunday. Lord, we ask that you'll meet with us and do something very special for us in our hearts and our lives, we pray. We love you again, and we thank you for all that you do. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a hand or two. Go to Heidi's on Friday. Sylvia, thank you again for playing. Uh, we do appreciate that. Um, I got a gift to give her on a Wednesday night. We don't have visitors usually on Wednesday night. I want to give you something tonight because it's usually on Sunday thing. But I want to. I want to. Could you get her a card real quick, Roger? He's going to give you a card real quick just to get your name and stuff, so I have a record, and then I'll give you a gift on the way out. Uh, and I want to thank you because I'm going to be honest with you. I had a I had a woman in my church in Indiana that played the piano, and we struggled for three years. With uh, we had a lady that played, and she was in her 90s, and she was hurt, and so she'd play halfway because she was just, she'd hurt herself. And finally it came to the point, she's like, I have to quit. And we went to play in those CDs where you sing to CDs, and it's hard. And, and this woman finally came up and said, well, I play. And I was like, where have you been for three years? And uh, so her, she just volunteered right away. She did not hesitate, just raised her. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And uh, that's those good Virginian people. Amen. 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 But thank you again. We appreciate that. So, But uh, shake a hand or two, and then, like I say, Friday night, 6 o'clock, out at Heidi's. Yes, ma'am.